This category has not been touched until Seek, the company we're talking to today, since the 1800s. Do you feel, Alyssa, when you were working with the metal, did you have the experience that you were working in the Stone Ages? I have literally been on both sides of this barbaric piece of equipment for more than 25 or 30 years. When you think about redesigning a product, it never occurred to me that the hand injuries would be what would happen to many people who are doing these exams over and over again. I can tell you anecdotally, I have two colleagues who went out and retired earlier than I think their cognitive abilities would have uh, suggested they should. Welcome to the business of the V. Hello, friends and colleagues. I'm Dr. Alyssa Dweck. And I'm Rachel Braunschirl. Each week, we bring you the most fascinating investors, inventors, entrepreneurs, academics, and healthcare practitioners who are making things happen in women's sexual and reproductive health. If you are a woman, know a woman, have a business, or care about your V health and wellness, fasten your seatbelts and listen in to another informative and inspiring episode. We are so excited for our conversation today to talk about an amazing innovation in the area of gyneolo gynecological care. We talk about often on this podcast how many areas of women's sexual and reproductive health have been the beneficiaries of innovation. And the folks we're talking to today have taken one of those areas that hadn't been touched and are really transforming it. It's our pleasure today to welcome Fatih Kasro who is the founder and CEO of Seek and Tracy Bennett, Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing to talk to us about how they have reimagined and redesigned the Speculum. Welcome ladies. Thank you for having us, Rachel. So we're thrilled to have you. And like so many other entrepreneurs in this broad space of women's health, many of these companies were birthed or the idea was created as a result of personal experience. Share with us how your experience going through your um, fertility journey gave rise to this idea and ultimately to this company. Sure, no problem. So um, before I actually started Seek, I did management consulting and biopharma. And so I worked across a whole host of disease states, but oncology was really the area that I spent a lot of time in. During that time, I got married and my husband and I went through three years of infertility treatment, which really was a shock to me. Um, and we traveled the country. I was really determined. I actually went through seven rounds of IVF. And um, one thing that really stood out for me was when I would go to see for uh, initially actually my OBGYN, um, and then I would go back to work. And then I would go see my reproductive endocrinologist. Then I would go back to work. And I just felt the pace of innovation that I was seeing in frontline care did not keep up pace where the, to the areas that I was working in, which just really gets a lot of money and a lot of focus goes into cancer therapeutics. And um, anyway, I was fortunate enough, I had my child. Um, I have two girls now, but after I had my second daughter, I was thinking about things. And it's really funny because when you're going through infertility, the speculum is a small part of it. It's really, I went through miscarriages and shots, you know, you name it. But the one thing that stood out for me was for some reason was that speculum. And I just thought, and I look, I remember actually Googling it. I'm like, why were all these like centers using this like yucky metal speculum? And um, so I Googled it and I'm like, wow, there really isn't anything um, aside from it available. And I, it came as a shock to me, actually. And then I did more research and I did more research and just my heart went into uh, women's health and I thought, well, if nobody's doing it, I want to do something about it. And so I resigned from my job and started Seek. I have to just jump right in and tell you in my practice, women come in and literally the first thing they'll say to me is, oh my God, are you going to use the clamp? Are you going to pull out that metal thing? I've had people name it the metal cowboy. I mean, crazy, crazy names because this 
archaic instrument, which is typically made of metal or plastic, for those people listening who may not be familiar with it, can be super uncomfortable and very threatening just to see. So uh, I'm so glad somebody uh, recognized that and decided to do something about it. Alyssa and Fati, for as long as you've been in this space, um, you've seen no innovation until SEEK. Am I right in my understanding that the last, it was developed in the 1800s and hasn't been modernized since? That's correct. Um, uh, absolutely correct. And I wish it had been innovated actually, and there were more options available, but um, it has not. Um, so it's, it was interesting for us. Um, when we were focusing on redesigning the speculum, we actually partnered with the consumer product design firm because I wanted the patient um, needs to be the focal point of the design. And then we worked with providers who would test and give us feedback on every single prototype that we made so that we could make it work for clinicians. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it had not been updated. And one of the areas we first focused on was actually the material choice that Alyssa just highlight talked about. We wanted a material that wasn't metal. And if I recall, you worked with the product design company originally that had um, done some of the earlier products for Apple. I, exactly. Um, yeah. Can you tell us a little about it? I'm thankfully I have been made very familiar with the uh, seed speculum and all its accoutrements, which I'm, I would love you to talk about. Uh, I've uh, trialed it in my office. It's a real game changer, especially for the, you know, the young woman who is having their first exam. Uh, maybe the menopausal woman who has, you know, a very delicate uh, vagina and uh, really sensitive to discomfort, or just everybody else who is so afraid because of the stories they've heard about this metal uh, clamp that's going in the vagina. Yeah, um, so um, one of the things that was really important for us was to make the speculum comfortable for women and really the initial insertion point. So we really had to dissect the speculum which is how is it used and then how is it built? And how is it used? We looked at um, uh, creating something that was very narrow, as narrow as a tampon. We thought if women can handle a tampon, they, could, they should be able to handle our speculum if it's that narrow. We had to make sure that providers had visibility and access to the cervix. So we wanted to make it narrow, but give providers that access. And so we were able to add lateral uh, sidewall retractors to the speculum to allow that to happen. And then the material choice was really important because providers want something that's strong, as so do patients. We don't want something that would break when it's in use, um, but we also didn't want it to be metal. Um, we also wanted something that was temperature neutral. So it wasn't cold to touch, did not require warming. So we spent a lot of time on material choice and that's how we landed with the product we have right now. Um, we did work with uh, a group of providers who I can tell you were super tough on us. Um, uh, there was a nurse midwife and also a male OBGYN and a female OBGYN. So for example, we had to make sure the grip of the speculum was comfortable for both men and women OBGYNs to hold in their, ha in their hand, not too thick, not too thin. Um, and then they would just, I mean, we did about 800 rounds of prototyping to get feedback on them. And so sometimes when customers actually try our products right now and they tell us like, could you do this? I'm like, we actually tested that, it didn't work. We did make it longer, it didn't work. <laughs> so we created so many variations of that. And um, we actually hired um, our chief design officer from the design firm we initially brought on board. And she's been really spearheading that. And she has a very strong consumer product background and was able to kind of um, drive and give us that focus. And because of my background, I worked with providers a lot. And really it was a collaboration between, um, I would say the providers we partnered with to help us design the speculum and patients who, you know, all of us here sitting here are patients as well that gave that feedback. I have to just chime in. There are so many women that I know in the field of OBGYN who are dealing with ergonomic in injuries in their hands from using metal speculums and having to really press down on this lever. And in some patients who might be, you know, uh, have had many children and have very uh, collapsed and relaxed vaginal walls or, you know, women who are uh, 
really overweight or whatnot. And holding that open has caused a lot of, uh, you know, user injury. So it's amazing to me that you thought of that and uh, tested it on men and women because I'm guessing that our hand strength differs a little bit. It does. It does. That was exactly it. Yeah. And to keep the wrist in a neutral position. And we also found out there are a number of uh, providers towards the end of their career actually develop arthritis of the thumb. And so it's really difficult for them to even hold the speculum. And um, we want to kind of reduce the, or, um, uh, that impact on providers also. It's so amazing when you think of all the different areas of care that are affected. I'm curious, Alyssa, since you've had the experience of working with SEEK and decades of working with the metal cowboy and for anyone who's listening who has had the experience of having a speculum inserted and open to do an exam have patients responded with as much joy as i believe they would <laughs> well i'm going to say that joy is probably not the ideal term but let's just be relative here. They're less miserable 1000%. And listen, when I trialed this um, um, device in my office, I, I pretty much told patients because I was the excited one and said, I'm trialing a new speculum that's you know, guaranteed to be more comfortable for you. So let me know what you think. So I did sort of uh, uh, you know, influence their decision a little bit, but yeah, it was super well received. But more for me, I don't think you can see, but I, I do have arthritis in my thumbs and I do attribute some of that to uh, doing this for 25 plus years. Um, I am certain that the patent process for uh, this type of complex device was tedious. Can you tell us a little about that? Uh, you nailed it. It was ex it was very expensive and very tedious. And but fortunately, we partnered with a really good attorney, patent attorney who um, it focuses on medical devices very early on in the process. And I'm really happy we did that um, because he really navigated us from a very early stage at what point to actually file our provisional patents and then the non-provisionals. We did it actually, before I spent the money on uh, developing the speculum, I had to know what was the open IP space. So we actually did some research beforehand to identify the open IP space before we developed the speculum. Uh, like just for example, one of the things we realized, I want to have a light that would work with the speculum that would make it easier for the providers to use. And the disposable plastic speculum have a light, but it's on the bottom bill. And so that space is really locked in. And we were able to use the top bill uh, to allow our light uh, to grip to it. Today's hot flash is gonna focus on pelvic exams. Welcome to my day to day. Were you aware that in the US alone, more than 55,000 clinicians are performing a speculum exam on average seven to 30 times in a day? Cumulatively, this adds up to more than 60 million speculum exams per year. While you're describing the top and bottom bill, Tracy, I think you have one in front of you. It'd be great to see what it looks like. For those of you who are listening um, audio only, which most of you are, uh, Tracy will describe what it looks like and how it works. Absolutely. So this is the, we talked about the narrowness of the upper and lower bill. It's about the size of regular tampons. That's super important for the patient comfort, but um, obviously we need to make sure that providers have access and visibility. So when I open it up, you see the lateral sidewalls that open up and that really keeps the vaginal sidewalls back so you have optimal visibility and access. I just want to add that what we have done in old-fashioned times before such a cool invention came about, we as providers would literally take a rubber glove and cut the tip off one of the fingers and put it over this device, the regular metal speculum, to try to hold back the vaginal wall so we could see. And needless to say, this was a very makeshift uh, way of, of doing an exam. You're absolutely right, Alyssa. Um, so it's it's fantastic because number one, you have a very narrowness of the, of the upper and lower bill. So it's more comfortable with the patient, but then more importantly for the provider, it really lives, it gives them the access and visibility that they need by keeping the lateral sidewalls back. Um, and I know the viewers or the listeners can't see this, but you can see really does a great job of illuminating the cervix and the um, vaginal sidewalls for optimal access visibility, plus more importantly, patient comfort. 
Tracy, I'm curious. I know you've done a lot of research at this point with Obgynes and other physicians as well as patients. I'm dying to know what are some of the adjectives that patients use when they have an exam with this that sort of just makes you smile. Working in the space when you're creating a product that really makes a difference, it's so motivating to continue to do the work. No, absolutely. Thank you for asking that. Um, I've been in this space for well over 20 years. And I have to tell you the one thing since I've been with Sigma Women's Health um, over three and a half years now, the reactions we get um, from both of the providers when they see this in person, but then hearing the patients also talk about, wow, what a fantastic experience. And it just makes it so that you know, we'll get, for example, providers say, oh my gosh, why didn't I think of this? Or it's about time. Or I've had providers say, I've used this metal, and I have an example the metal one here. I've been using this metal torture device for so long. I'm so glad that somebody thought of this. Um, it was very important for us as a company to make it for both the provider and the patient a better experience overall. Um, in patients, by far, um, you know, we've had patients that will miss exams or skip exams because they don't want to go. Nobody likes to go, but we all know how important it is. And with this device, they will now, you know, follow up on their regular routine exams and not dread them as much. So I, I do want to bring something up that uh, has been on my mind as a practitioner. This really bothered me when this news came out that both ACOG and the U.S. Health and Preventative Task Force came out basically minimizing the benefit of pelvic exams for asymptomatic non-pregnant women, essentially telling us as OBGYNs that what we're doing has no meaning whatsoever unless somebody has a complaint. I found this unbelievably insulting because, you know, I, I would like to think that the exam I'm doing has value and I do feel that it does from a clinical standpoint. But then again, maybe I have a skewed population who comes in because they are symptomatic or pregnant. However, as this came out within the last two or three years, and you're clearly developing your product over this time, did you feel that the unmet need was lessened by that suggestion from these, you know, noteworthy agencies? I was kind of shocked when I actually heard that. It was very disappointing because I can tell you just my story, for example. I mean, I, I, I regularly went to see my OBGYNs um, and, and I thought I was the most fertile woman. And um, honestly, there were some, uh, it wasn't until I tried to get pregnant and I had issues, but I, I kind of felt like, um, you know, a lot of, if I had not seen my GYNs earlier on, I probably would not have been diagnosed for various conditions. I was the perfect example of somebody who was completely asymptomatic. Um, and to be honest, a lot of cervical cancer starts in women. It doesn't, you don't get it suddenly out of the blue and you know you have cervical cancer. So I think earlier detection is absolutely key. And most women are completely asymptomatic. Um, and so I, I found it to be rather rubbish. So. Yeah, not only that, I feel like it's just an opportunity to get someone in the office to speak to them about what may make them asymptomatic, what may make them symptomatic, uh, and maybe they don't realize it. But did that have any influence on whether you were going to go forward with this product or not? Uh, no, I mean, we Good. were going forward with Good it. Good to hear. To me, it's really the foundation of care right now that women receive. It's really what's used for every exam and uh, my goal was to make a little bit of a dent in it for women to make it more comfortable for them. And also for my daughter, I mean, my other thought was, you know, my daughter is going to go to the GYN, I don't know, five, she's now nine by the time she's 18, 19. And I just wanted something that was more comfortable for her. Um, and, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, others will follow us and they'll actually develop better products. Um, but that was our goal. So no, it did not um, keep me back. How is the product doing in the market? Uh, it's doing great. We've had a limited release of it. Um, we launched in August, but obviously a lot of clinics have been shut down. So we have access to about 10% of our provider group. So we are planning on having a relaunch around the June, uh, July timeframe when hopefully with the pandemic easing up and um, uh, people getting vaccinated, um, seeing their providers, we can then have a proper launch of the product. You wrote something interesting. I read something fascinating that you said um, 
under the category, if you, if you dream it, you can make it happen. Can you share the dream you had and how it actually came true at the end of 2020 with the Time Magazine? I have to tell you, that was a dream come true for me. I never thought we would win that award. And um, uh, I remember like, actually when we first started, I, I had picked up from the airport a copy of Time Magazine with the latest inventions. And I brought it to Maria, who's our head of design. And I said, Maria, I want our device to be in that magazine. <laughs> and she looked at me and she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, no, I'm serious. I want our device to be in that magazine. And so, um, yeah, it was when we applied and I, I you know, I, I didn't know what to expect, but it has three phases and we went through phase one and I'm like, Maria came to me and was like, Kwati, I think we passed phase one, we're in phase two. I'm like, okay, and so um, we won the award. So I do think, you know, every company, especially a startup, set a goal um, and push through it and um, it will happen. For us, I felt for, our, for us and our team, it's not just me. I mean, we have a team behind us that really works closely, is really passionate about women's health. To make this happen um, was amazing for all of us. So what year did you pick up that magazine? You got the recognition in December of 2020. How long was it until your vision became a reality? 2016. It was December of 2016. Yep. <laughs> I remember it precisely. I actually have every edition of Time magazine with the awards, but that was the 2016 version. So what's coming down the pike for Seek other than a more formalized launch and, uh, you know, super distributed product, which I hope every office can, uh, can do? Well, our first goal is to get the product out. We're a small team and um, we ha our manufacturing has to keep up with demand. So it's really to get the product out. Um, we also have two other products that are in our pipeline that are hope we're hoping to launch them probably early next year. And all of the focal point of our products is really to make the gynecological exam frontline care for women. Uh, easier for pro uh, providers, just give the providers a toolbox that they can actually use and choose what products they have, something I felt that was missing, and also to make it better and more comfortable for women. Um, I do want to highlight one other thing. It's just because I think it's important about who I am, and you brought up that Time Magazine article. You know, I'm an Iranian woman. I actually went to school in Iran. And I just want to say I never thought, um, um, you know, as a girl in Iran, I would win a Time Magazine award. And so, it's, it's actually a little bit emotional, but um, uh, I hope a lot of girls realize that regardless of where they are and they set the bar high. That's beautiful. Having just watched the Super Bowl where we had a bunch of firsts, the first female referee um, on the field, first two female assistant coaches, and your story, we're, we're, we're just continuing to hopefully break barriers. And I love that the emotion is about the power and the impact this can have on your, your daughter and future generations. Thank you. And on my profession. So thank you. And uh, it's a wonderful story. Thanks so much for being here. There's so much to talk about. Um, so much more to talk about. Your story is amazing. And we can't wait to see what comes out in uh, 2021. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure. Don't forget, subscribe to our podcast at businessofthev.com for the latest trends and trendsetters in women's health and business.